You're listening to How India's Economy Works, hosted by journalist and author Pooja Mehra. Hello, I'm Pooja Mehra. We are going to talk today about India's wheat economy. Wheat farmers, especially those from Punjab, are casually demonized in the political and economy discourse. It is made to seem like they're very wealthy, their riches are built on subsidies funded by taxpayers. Their contribution to India's economic security isn't fully appreciated. All of this distracts from the policy failures that put India's food security at risk, especially as climate change is reducing farm output, resulting in higher prices. My guest today is Mr. Siraj Hussain, who was India's Agriculture Secretary. He also headed the Food Corporation of India, the organization that procures food grains from farmers and manages food supplies, including the buffer stocks. Mr. Hussain is a prolific writer and researcher on India's farm sector. I asked him to tell us about India's wheat economy from the time of independence to now. I also asked him about how farmers are demonized in the discourse. Mr. Hussain, agriculture and food are important for any country, but especially in a country like India, where the population is larger than most countries and also farming is a source of livelihood for more than half the working population. Therefore, without taking into consideration the agriculture sector, it's not really possible to understand the Indian economy. The farm sector is, of course, made of many subsectors, dairy, poultry, horticulture, food grains, etc. But today, I want you to help us understand the very basics of Indian agriculture and the farm economy, which is wheat. And to understand which, I suppose, we should start from time of independence. So how was the Indian wheat economy at the time of independence? And how has it evolved over time? How has that affected the Indian economy? And how has it in turn got affected by what's been going on in the rest of the economy? Okay, so thank you, Pooja, for inviting me to this discussion. You see, the first generation of leaders of Indian independence were very well-read people. And they were not only well-read, most of them were also very good writers. They were traveling a lot and they were traveling by trains and maybe by buses. So they were aware of the Indian historical difficulties of famines. The Niti Ayog in a paper has documented at least 12 or 13 famines across India. Generally, when we talk of famines, we only think of the Great Bengal Famine of 1943, in which 2 to 3 million people were killed. But even before that, there were famines starting from 1769, in which 2 to 10 million people are said to have been killed. And the famines affected not only Bengal, but also other parts of India, for example, Agra famine, Odisha famine, Rajasthan famine, Bihar famine, even in South India, 1876 to 78, there was a famine in which 6 to 10 million people are feared killed. And between 1896 to 1900, some 15 million people were killed. So all this would have weighed heavily on the minds of our leaders after independence. Now, the independence came with partition in which India was left with only 82% of the pre-partition population, about 80% of the pre-partition population, but only 75% of landmass. And at that time, many of us seem to forget when we criticize Green Revolution. At that time, only 15% of farming was under irrigation and about 80-85% was rain-fed. So India was in real difficulty in the initial years and for many years, we were dependent on import of food, especially wheat. And at one point of time, the president of US was imposing restrictions on export of wheat to India and other countries. So his daughter Lucy had to intervene and persuade her father to allow export of wheat to India. So it is generally called ship to mouth existence because ships were landing almost every other day. And this difficulty was not lost on the Prime Minister Nehru and other members of his cabinet. And they realized that something has to be done for this. In addition to this, there was a debate 
between those who followed Gandhiji's idea of self-sufficiency and self-restraint and Nehru's idea of becoming self-sufficient and industrialization. So all these forces were working at the same time, which gives you a background of what was going on, what would have been going on in the mind of the policymakers. And let me also add that when Nehru went to U.S., he went to Tennessee River Project. I think it was 1948. So that is how he conceived Bhakra Nangal Dam in the very initial year. Of course, these days we read critique even about Bhakra Nangal Dam. So India started with these difficulties. And after that, till the time we proceed with green revolution-led policies, for Indian agriculture, because of the irrigation projects, etc., that had been started, was there any improvement in food supply, or it was because population was also growing, it was at the same status as it was at the time of independence? Actually, immediately after independence and even before that, the government set up a number of committees, as we do now, which were submitting its recommendations from time to time. Also, there was some kind of difference of opinion, we may even call it a conflict between the planning commission and the government. So many of your listeners would identify with, with these differences of opinion. Of course, at that time, the planning commission was free to express its opinion. Finally, the success of the Mexican variety of dwarf wheat was realized by the policymakers in which Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, then a junior scientist, also played some role. And India imported that dwarf variety of seeds. And the cultivation began in a village in Delhi and also in some places in Haryana. Before we come to that, I would like you to tell us about how when we started importing wheat under the special scheme of the US president where the administration, US administration would allow export of wheat to countries and then how that led to the setting up of the public distribution system and then there were droughts and shortages. So the conditions got created for the Green Revolution. If you could take us through that. Actually, the public distribution system was operating before independence also, during the Second World War. And of course, at that time, due to shortage of uh, food grains in India, every individual was only entitled to, if I remember correctly, 900 grams, less than a kilogram of uh, wheat per person, per month. Now, under the National Food Security Act, the government is giving 5 kilograms per person per month. So it was less than a kilogram per person per month. At that point of time, in the initial years from 1948 to about 60s, India was dependent on import of wheat. And it was basically the United States which came to India's assistance and U.S. set up a number of committees. The Ford Foundation also gave a technical report to the government of India that India has to adopt technological interventions to feed its growing population. Foreign exchange was also in short supply at that time. The initial years of Green Revolution required import of fertilizers also. For that, foreign exchange was needed. And similarly, foreign exchange was needed for purchase of seeds also. So all these things were creating difficulties. But finally, the government decided to go ahead with the technological intervention through Green Revolution, through improved seed supply, through import of fertilizers, especially urea in the beginning. And later on, the government set up, as Dr. Gulati has written a number of times, the Commission for Agriculture Cost and Prices, CACP, and the government also decided that it will procure surplus quantity of food grains because by that time, Haryana and Punjab had started producing surpluses. So that is how from 1948 to about 60s, we were dependent on exports. And then it was only later from 60s onwards that the benefits of Green Revolution started flowing in. And the first phase of Green Revolution is said to be occurring from about 1965-66. By that time, Lal Bahadur Shastri had become the prime minister to about 75-76. And it continued till about 1980. And the crop sector especially wheat, continued to provide food security to most of India. 
In fact, I read somewhere that in the second or the third year of Indian farmers planting the Mexican seeds, which had been adapted by Indian scientists for Indian conditions. And I think in the third year, the harvest was such a bumper harvest that India didn't know where to store all this wheat. And they were using classrooms in village schools to store this wheat. And even the railways ran out of wagons to transport this wheat that was being produced in Haryana and Punjab for it to be supplied to the rest of the parts of the country. And suddenly from extreme shortages, we went to sort of happy days. Yes, you are right. Actually, in the first phase of Green Revolution, as I said, from about 1966 to 1976, first 10 years, the crop sector grew by 2.19% every year in terms of value of output. So it was a very successful intervention. And that is how the Food Corporation of India was set up of which I had the privilege of being the chairman and MD for two years. And the Food Corporation of India started procuring the food grains and the Commission for Agriculture Cost and Prices, uh, CACP, started recommending to government the minimum support price. The government started procuring wheat at that price and distributing it to people. So these couple of things, starting with MSP, declaration of MSP, the procurement of food grains, better quality of seeds, use of uh, imported urea in the beginning, all these, and of course the farmers who took to growing the new variety of Mexican, you know, developed by, initially developed by Mexican scientists and later on adapted by Indian scientists, agriculture scientists, especially Punjab Agriculture University. So all these things contributed to generating surpluses especially of wheat. And of course, later on, other crops also experienced better development of seeds, etc. And if we want to discuss that, we will briefly see that Indian success story is not only about wheat or the crop sector. We have also been highly successful in fruits and vegetables, livestock, fisheries and poultry. Right. I'll come to that. But your experience at HCI and you were agriculture secretary, of course, and also food supplies. So if you could explain what was the purpose of introducing the minimum support price mechanism? What was the purpose of setting up the FCI? What was the purpose of government procuring from farmers who were suddenly producing in huge quantities wheat in Punjab and Haryana? And at that point in time, this served a purpose and, you know, how should we view it today, more than 50 years later? See, Pooja, even today we find that when the farmers harvest their crop, when most of the farmers harvest their crop and the arrivals peak, the prices fall down. We are watching this with dismay. Even in case of mustard this year, India is importing about 60 to 65 percent of its edible oil and yet the mustard prices are below MSP. So at that time, in the initial years, you know, coming out of shortage, the government correctly decided that the farmers should get a fair price so that they are incentivized to grow the new variety of wheat. Now, uh, in hindsight, uh, we can say that this has damaged Indian agriculture and, and you know, a number of things are written about the harmful effects of Green Revolution. But I think at that point of time, by setting up the Food Corporation of India, the government not only provided support to the farmers for growing the newer varieties of wheat, but also the government was supporting the consumers by providing ration at a reasonable price. People of our generation remember that even so-called middle classes of course, they are not comparable to today's middle class. Almost everyone except the very elite was standing at the ration shops to collect their ration. It was the need of the hour to set up the Commission for Agriculture Cost and Prices, set up Food Corporation of India, procure the food grains in surplus regions of Punjab, Haryana. And by that time, by late 60s, early 70s, the Green Revolution had also reached Western UP. So in all these areas, surplus was being generated and that was being procured. I think it was the correct policy decision at that time. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't appreciate that suddenly when our harvest arrives in the market because supply suddenly exceeds demand, prices tend to fall. And therefore, there is need for supporting those prices at a minimum level. But as you, over several conversations over the years, 
and several other economists who are involved in Indian uh, agriculture keep saying that what was supposed to be minimum support price sometimes ends up becoming maximum support price. Minimum support price is supposed to move from year to year depending on the supply demand, but it just always increases. We never hear of minimum support price having been reduced. So if you want to explain a bit of you know how the economics of procurement, MSP, FCI became subservient to the politics. Actually, Pooja, you are right that there has not been a year when the minimum support price has been fixed lower than the previous year. And your listeners would be interested in knowing what happens in China. In China, the support price can be different from province to province. And the support price can also go down depending on the demand supply situation, the global situation, etc. Of course, in India, because of the wide scale poverty and impoverishment of farmers, the government decides to fix minimum support price, which is remunerative. And you would record that in 2019, the government even decided that henceforth, it will be dictated by a formula of providing at least 50% return. So now there is a formula and it has no relationship with the global prices. Of course, we have to realize that since February 2022, we have entered a phase in which the climate change, excessive heat in North India has affected the wheat crop due to which the procurement has gone down and the situation of excessive procurement has drastically changed. So at the moment, we are in a situation in which we are, if I may say so, wanting to persuade the farmers to supply to the government and with great difficulty, the procurement this year has reached 26 million tons, which is about the same as last year. And it is not very clearly understood why the procurement is much less as compared to government expectation. Because if the production this year is 112 million tons, then there is no reason. Of course, one more thing has happened, which was studied by us, me and Shweta Saini, in a study of mustard and chana farmers in Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan, that now, Due to availability of more information with the farmers and better storage facilities with the farmers, which have been created over the last 25 years under Grameen Bandara and Yojana, the farmers are also withholding their crop in the expectation of better prices. At the moment, we are in a situation where some farmers are wanting to retain their crop for realizing better prices. The government is wanting to procure more, and the government is not quite successful in achieving that. And we have seen that in UP, for example, UP is a very large producer of wheat, but we find that the overall procurement of wheat is not even 10 lakh tons. So this MSP debate, whether how useful it is and whether it has lost its relevance today, it also depends on year to year. And right now we are in a phase in which the government thinks and those who are interested in food security of large masses of population think that procurement is necessary. I agree with that, especially until the time, I suppose, if you're going to live with climate change, until the time our scientists are able to develop new seeds that are more heat resistant, most certainly I think we are going to have to do a lot of procurement. So let's come to the present now. You're saying that the government is facing suddenly from the time when we, we were worried that government was procuring far more than was needed for the country, the government is not managing to meet its procurement targets. Does that tell us that the MSP policy needs tweaking? It's now out of sync with what will work in the wheat economy. And do, do we need to feel worried about how climate change is going to be a very big factor on food security? going forward? Now, we have to remember that the National Food Security Act enacted in 2013 by the UPA government guarantees 5 kilograms per person per month of food grains to every person for the priority sector households and to the Antyode household, 35 kilograms per family per month. So, if the NFSA commitment has to continue and the present government has already announced that it will not charge anything from the consumers for the next five years. If this has to continue, then procurement also has to continue. And if procurement has to continue, 
then the government has to uh, provide our remunerative price to farmers. Also, we should remember that this year, the government of Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan announced a bonus on wheat. Of course, the UP government did not announce that, Haryana did not do that, Punjab did not do that, but Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan did that. And even then, the procurement in Madhya Pradesh is about 4.7 million tons. Again, less than what they procured a couple of years back, they had reached about 8 million tons, more than 8 million tons. So it is true that climate change seems to be impacting our agriculture in ways which are quite surprising. But what is not understood, and even I have not been able to understand is, if the production is in the range of 110 million tons, and if the consumption as per the Niti Ayuk data is in the range of 100 to 105 million tons, then why is there a pressure on prices? And why have we not been able to procure in the last three years? So remember, in 2022-23, we procured 18 million tons, and then last year and this year, about 26 million tons. So uh, you've been agriculture secretary and uh, you've been in the food supplies department, uh, Mr. Sen. How good are our estimates of food production? Perhaps we are overestimating food production because from what I understand, uh, there is a very big change in the past two, three years where farmers are not able to export their produce of wheat. Private players are not able to, beyond a point, procure from farmers. So the only option available to farmers because of some very heavy-handed policies of the government the only option available to farmers is to sell what they're producing to government through FCI and state procurement. So where is this food that is being produced going? It probably means that it's not being produced. Frankly, uh, Pooja, now after retirement, I'm meeting the trade much more frequently and much more widely than what I used to do when I was in the government. Because in the government, First of all, you don't have time. You are busy with other things, parliamentary committees, assembly parliament questions, travel with the ministers and so on. So now I get more time and I do get this feeling from the trade that the wheat production last year, for example, was not 110 million tons as per the government estimates, but it was in the range of about 100 to 103 million tons. Now, the government has a better idea of uh, production because government uses various parameters, including satellite data, information from the state governments, and various other sources. So I would not say that the government data is wrong, but there is surely a need to understand in a much better way the actual production. As far as I know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have also given a study in which a lot of money is being spent to better assess the production. Having said this, I also find it quite surprising that even the sugar mills, which are much better connected with the sugarcane farmers, because sugarcane is a highly controlled commodity, even they get their estimates of sugarcane production so wrong. And you would recall that in the last year, initially when the season started in October, the general feeling was that sugar production is going to be much lower, just about 28 million tons. So, you know, there are difficulties in making a correct assessment, but I think that the government does realize the need of better assessment of production data so that it can do a better planning. I, I thought for a country which is uh, so much into digital economy, IT, etc., can we not use satellites and drones, etc., for getting a better sense of what the production is going to be? For Because, you know, you can always monitor what's going on on the farms, who's sowing how much? The previous government had set up Mahalanobis Crop Forecasting Center in the Department of Agriculture, which uses a lot of satellite data to give an estimate of production. And that data is shared with the ministry. The ministry also gets data from the state governments. I think under the BMGF project, some experiments are also going on to collect data through drones. But as I said, if the sugar mills are not able to correctly assess the production of sugar cane, you can imagine how difficult and problematic it is to assess the production of other commodities in which trade and industry is not so closely aligned with the farmers. So there are difficulties, but 
I would not say that government data is 10% overstated. Right. And both you and I, we follow the economy discourse. Uh, all the things that we have discussed today, all the issues that you have raised today, we don't see an appropriate appreciation of this in the normal economy discourse. Because if an economy does not have food security, that's a very difficult situation to get into. We, you know, I, I'm reminded of what you just uh, explained to us about what was happening in the post-independence years. We don't want to go back to a situation we are going to where we are going to have to import lots of wheat year after year or, uh, you know, sugar. And secondly, according to latest data, 45% of our working population works on the farms. So they are also a base for consuming what the industry produces. The relevance of what you're saying to the overall macroeconomic policy making, do you want to say something about that? I think all those who follow the Indian economy seriously realize that food security cannot be a matter of chance. And the government has also taken a number of steps in the last two years, as we have seen, by restricting the export, by fixing minimum export price and so on, by imposing restrictions under the Essential Commodities Act. Now, many a times these actions are criticized by economists who say that it should be an open economy, farmers should be free to sell, etc. But as I have written repeatedly, no government, whatever its color, can allow double-digit inflation in basic food grains like cereals. Now, in the last two years, we have seen that the cereal inflation has been in double digits many a times, and that is why these restrictions have come. So, it means that there is a need for increasing the production much more, especially of pulses and oil seeds, so that we do not depend on imports too much. Now, wheat and rice both continues to be somewhat enigmatic because the production estimate given by the government is still more than the domestic consumption. So the real reason for double-digit inflation in both wheat and rice, wheat for some time and rice continues to be double-digit, is not adequately understood. Right, but Mr. Sen, I'm also one of those who do not support all this heavy-handed government action bans on exports or restrictions on exports through minimum export prices, etc. If the government wants to protect the consumer because food inflation is entering into double-digit territory, the way to do it is not to transfer the incomes of the farmers to the consumers by taking away the income-earning opportunities of farmers. And especially because, you know, it's all right if they were all very large farmers, but there are very small farmers who, as the data is showing, their wages have been stagnant. So I'm sure there are other ways for the government to protect the consumer. It cannot be at the cost of the farmer's earnings. And all of these policies that are being used, they are bad economic policies because they support the consumer by reducing the incomes of the farmers. You've been in government, you've walked this tight rope between what is good for farmers and what is good for consumers. You don't think that what I'm saying is right? Actually, the governments try to balance the interest of consumers with the interest of farmers. But as I said, if the inflation is in double digits for basic cereals like wheat, rice, pulses, edible oils, etc., then the government finds it difficult to manage the economy as a whole because then it has impact on other items also. It does not remain confined to food and that inflation becomes generalized and that results in raising of interest rates and there are several consequences of that. Actually, you are right that there are several other ways, complete restriction on export or fixation of a very high minimum export price may not be the correct policy in several cases. So, for example, last year, I wrote several pieces, many other people also wrote about it, that government should allow import of wheat at, by reducing duty, maybe to even zero duty, so that this condition of deficiency is mitigated to a large extent. And I think this year, for all you know, the government may have to allow that. I very strongly feel that if inflation continues to be in late single digit or, or in double digits for both wheat and rice, then we should allow import of wheat. 
Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. But a way to support consumers cannot be to take away the income earning opportunities for farmers, especially when we have such a large number of farmers, such a large percentage of the population dependent on farming for their livelihoods. And such a large part of this working population is so poor. It seems a bit unfair to me. And, and, and I'm sure economists and experts such as you can find better policies to sort of help resolve this trade-off. Before I end, my last question to you is that, you know, uh, in the normal discourse, farmers are sort of demonized quite a bit for wanting uh, better earning opportunities. So if you could just put it a bit in perspective on how important farmers are for our economy, sometimes because there is, we have a culture of subsidies, MSP, etc., it's not widely understood how much the economy depends on farmers and how we probably need to take a slightly nuanced view of the farm economy? I think those who understand the agriculture sector and the economic issues in general appreciate that the subsidies which are being provided by the government to the farmers are actually helping keep the prices low, which is basically for the benefit of the consumer. So, for example, if the farmers are getting urea at a subsidized rate, then the cost of production is lower and the consumer is paying a lower price. Supposing the fertilizer subsidies are totally withdrawn, then the cost of production is going to be higher and then the consumer will have to pay a higher price. Actually, what has happened is that due to, let us say, misinformation through the media during the farmer's agitation, there is a lot of coloring of people's opinion based on their political preferences. And people think that farmers are heavily subsidized and as if it is making them earn much more than others. Actually, our farmers in most of the places are quite poor. And as the Situation Assessment Survey has revealed that their earnings are just about 10 to 15,000 average farmers earning. And we need to support our agriculture to remain a food secure nation. Because otherwise, as we have seen in the last one month, the wheat prices in the international market have risen. So it depends whether we can produce surpluses on a consistent basis, because then only we will be able to export, we will become a reliable exporter, and we can support our large population. And uh, my absolute last question, you know, if you could share some anecdote from your time when you were in Krishi Bhavan as Agriculture Secretary, which sort of captures this whole thing that you're saying. Uh, you see, uh, at one point of time in 2006-07, when India was importing wheat, you know, some of the wheat which came into India was red in color. So I remember that the chief minister of Madhya Pradesh, Mr. Shivraj Singh Chauhan, had come and he showed that wheat to Mr. Sharad Pawar and said that this is the wheat being supplied to us. So he was told that this is what we are getting in the international markets and there is not much which can be done. And after that, Madhya Pradesh very successfully put up a very competent system of procurement, which resulted in wheat procurement exceeding that of Haryana year after year. And that was a very successful intervention by Madhya Pradesh. Yeah, in fact, uh, a lot of people have the view that probably Mr. Shivrat Chahan would have made a very good agriculture minister, especially because he commands the trust of the farming community. And he may have been the right person to talk with farmers on behalf of government and ensure that farm sector reforms are, are carried through. But I guess that's a conversation we, we can have on another day in another episode. Thank you so much for taking out time. Thank you, Pooja. With the planet heating up as quickly as it is, there's no time to lose on repairing the farm sector, which means correcting policy failures. Otherwise, we may be back to the post-independence era of heavy dependence on food imports. You've been listening to How India's Economy Works, hosted by journalist and author Pooja Mehra. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopses or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback, so do write to us at feedback at the core.in. 
Thank you for listening.